Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have Kevin Curley here. Kevin, what's going on? Getting ready for Halloween. What's what your you costume do? this year, Tom? I don't do Halloween. That's uh, that's amateur <laughs> night when you don't have kids. Well, I have three of them, so I'll be dressing up. I'm not sure what yet, but maybe something Star Wars. Who knows? Last year, I was Wario, which was a pretty good time. What do you think? The, what do you think the big costume is going to be this year? Ken and Barbie. Uh, the the funniest one I've seen is the guy from Creed uh, at the Cowboys halftime show. I've seen that one going around. I think that'd be funny if I see that. When is Halloween? It's on a Tuesday. So next Tuesday, yeah. What's like the you know? How do people know when to go trick or treating? Is it is it typically like dark. Saturday before? No, but do you trick or treat? No, no, you on go Tuesday? actual day. Yeah, you go on Tuesday, and as soon as it gets dark out, that's that's go time. So dusk, mosquitoes are gone, time to go. So do, do parents go with the kids? I mean, it's Depends not... Depends on the age. For my yeah. kids, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe have... a few years from now, not so much, and then they just stop completely, and they go cause havoc. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's well, an adventure. Well, enjoy. I'll be, my lights will be off in my house, and door will be locked. Um, yeah, that's so. not the friendliest way to go. You can at least <laughs> hand out apples and be a real Scrooge. So, <laughs> all right, let's jump into it. So, uh, mid month podcast, we will do our topics on something or nothing. Um, we'll jump into some mailbag questions and then we'll finish with uh, five good minutes and the topic, although boring, important, uh, will be on Medicare. <laughs> It's open enrollment, Tom. Get excited about Medicare open, open enrollment. Open enrollment. And for those of you that aren't even close to Medicare, it's still good to know you might have parents, loved ones that are at that age, and there's some good tips we'll, uh, we'll, we'll touch on. So let's jump into something or nothing. Uh, Kevin, I'll, I'll throw the first one to you. Ireland's rise in SUVs, um, coupled with the the health and wealth of the economy, the sovereign wealth fund heading to 100 billion. Uh, what are your thoughts? I think this is something. Uh, Ireland was the Celtic Tiger 20 years ago. Uh, it really took a, a tough time for the last few, I'll call it decade or so, from the great financial crisis till about now. And now we're seeing that the rise in SUVs is just kind of a marker of wealth as far as the uh, income of the country goes. So you see a lot more of those that tend to be a lot more expensive than sedans or some of the smaller cars. And on top of that, they're having, they call it a bumper tax season uh, of a windfall as far as credits coming from Google and some of the pharmaceutical companies and other ones that are based over there. They're paying a lot in corporate taxes and they're thinking about starting a sovereign wealth fund. It's predicted that a handful of years from now, that could be over a hundred billion dollars. Uh, Ireland's on the rise. And I think this is something as the only English speaking nation in the EU. How about you? Yeah. Let's say uh, you, Tom. Kennedy uh, and Curly talking about Ireland. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm indifferent on it. I, it's hard. I've never heard, I've never seen a comparison between SUVs and the wealth of an economy, but I mean, two thirds of every car purchased over in Ireland uh, is an SUV, almost seventy percent, which is which is kind of crazy. Um, yeah, the roads are tiny. <laughs> the, the the roads are tiny, but uh, you know the sovereign wealth fund. So they have a target to get to one hundred billion dollars uh, over the next ten years, and you know they're assuming a four percent rate of return, which I think is you know, pretty modest and they're plan on investing 0.8% of their nominal GDP into this fund. So I think that's something the SUV, it might just, the SUV sales might just be a coincidence. Uh, but I do think it is something with, uh, with that country's doing and what it looks like over the next 10 years. Yeah. The most interesting part about it is learning from their mistakes. So back in the Celtic tiger days, the leadership goes, we have extra money. What should we do with it? And they all said, we should spend it. 
<laughs> and this time around they go, oh, maybe a rainy day fund, maybe a sovereign wealth fund. Maybe we should keep some of this just in case things don't look so good five years from now or 10 years from now. Well, you know, I heard mistakes, that, Tom. you know, you could, you could declare citizenship to Ireland. If you can, if you can go back, I think up to three generations, which I can, unfortunately, but, uh, it's a grandparent you, clause. I, you have to have a grandparent who was a citizen. And then I wish I wish the US would, for would learn those of us have been here for a while. It's not available anymore. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunate. We're stuck here in the US. That's another conversation. Hard knock life. All right. Next topic, Tom. Uh, we've got a twenty three year high in mortgage rates. They hit seven point five seven percent on the thirty year fix. Uh, the prior peak was eight and a half percent, which we hit in December of two thousand. Uh, are these skyrocketing rates something or nothing? And will we break eight and a half percent in this cycle? Um, yeah, this is this is something. And I'm going to spend I'm going to spend a couple minutes on this and throw out some stats uh, on just just the housing and interest rates. To your point, um, you know we haven't seen rates this high in in over twenty years. Uh, to answer your question, I do think we get to the eight and a half. I think we go past it. Uh, and if you look at mortgage applications, we've had the the, the the highest drop in mortgage applications since since May of 1995. Right now, it is 52% more expensive to buy a home than to rent one. So, you know, you see rent is high. It's <laughs> twice as more expensive to actually own a home. And if you look at who's buying homes, um, one, you know, Anyone under 35, I just saw a stat online, which I thought was really interesting. I think it was a Redfin. If home buyers under 35 years of age, 23% of them used cash from a gift from a family member or inheritance money for a down payment. Um, 40% of buyers under 30 received family money for a down payment. So you know, the younger generation doesn't have the money for these down payments and they're getting it from, from their family members. And if you look yeah, at those high rates, hurt. They, 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 they hurt. I mean, you need to make $115,000 more <laughs> to afford the, the, uh, the medium home sale price of a, of a home right now versus what it was a year ago. And this is just because of the increase in rates. I mean, they, they've doubled. So it's, you know, we threw out that stat a couple a couple months ago with you know either rates go down, prices go down, or a combination. But right now, it's just extremely unaffordable for the for the housing market. Um, but the challenge is, is that there's not a lot of supply out there because no one's moving because they're not going to get out of their three percent mortgage to get into a seven and a half or or eight percent mortgage. So, I think it's something. I think it's going to eventually have. It can. This is not sustainable. So the question becomes, what comes what comes down first, interest rates or housing prices? Uh, and I think it's going to be housing prices. I don't think rates are going to come down quick enough. And eventually, you're going to have to see the, the housing market come down. I don't think there's going to be a crash, but I think it will come down. Yeah, I think one big difference from like the 06 to 08 period is I don't think we have a ton of people in adjustable rate mortgages like we did before. And we're going to find out if those reforms for, you know, no lock, no doc loans went away, uh, if that mattered. And if people can't refinance and they were anticipating being able to do that, this is going to be a tough time. And like you said, new buyers, they're just they're not going to exist at eight and a half percent rates. So uh, one thing I think that we didn't talk about was the fact that quantitative easing, one of the things they did at the Federal Reserve was buy mortgage backed securities it artificially kept rates lower than what they were. So those with two and 3% mortgage rates, great for them, but it might be a situation where the natural rate of interest goes back down to four or five for a mortgage and, you know, seven, eight is still considered high, but you know, the amortization schedule on these is really ugly. A lot of these, you never end up paying more in principle than, uh, than interest. It just stays interest forever and never crosses that line as opposed to when it's two and 3%, you know, eight, 10, 15 years into the mortgage, suddenly you're paying more principal than you are interest. So high rates hurt. And I think it's a long-term problem. 
Well, I, I think I think to and to your point, I agree. A lot of these aren't adjustable rates, so you're fine there. You're not going to have this 2008 crisis all over again. But I think the difference is, and I've had some pushback where, you know, you look at 25 years ago, people are, you know that bought houses in the 80s are like, this is nothing. We had much higher interest rates back then. But the, the difference, yeah, but they were was, falling. <laughs> the, the, well, 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 not only that, but the difference was that the housing pricing was not even close to where it's at. You've had zero right. interest rates and cheap money for over 10 years that that housing has gone through the roof. And that's the big difference this time around is housing is just way, way too expensive. The actual price of a house and now where interest rates are, something's got to give. And it, 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 and it could be a combination where you see a drop in, in both rates and the housing market. But, um, you know, mortgage applications have fallen through the floor. Um, and a, another quick stat too, uh, I think it was, was it September? Um, bear with me a second. Uh, number of number of homeowners hit foreclosure notices in the third quarter jumped 34% from a year ago up to 125,000. So, you know, I think you're starting similar to see- thing in autos too. Yep, similar thing in autos. Um, just last month, you had, you had 25% of uh, offers fall through didn't go, didn't go to contract. So I think it's starting, it's starting to hit a little bit, but, uh, time will tell. Yeah, I know. Right in the face of like, what was the four and a half percent GDP number for the third quarter? And you go, Oh, the world's falling off a cliff. I don't know. Not yet, but well, G- GDP, did, GDP was expected. It's backwards at, looking. Yeah. yeah, yeah three and a half and it was a point higher. It's wild. Yep. Um, all right, Tom, we got big news in the, in the oil patch. I'm going to call it merger mania. Uh, Exxon announced they're going to buy Pioneer. Uh, Chevron announced they're going to buy Hess. There's been a, a bunch of small caps merge as well, which, you know, I, there's too many to even mention. But what's going on in the oil patch? Is this merger mania something or nothing? You know, I it's it's something. I, it, it's always something when it comes to oil and gas. And I'm, but I'm, I'm just I hesitate because I'm not. I'm also not not shocked either. I mean, one you have. You have the the break even point uh, for profitability has gone way way down than what it was three or four years ago. I mean, you know, you talk to some of these some of these you hear some of these CEOs speak and they're saying it's under forty dollars a barrel for them to break even, depending on where they are in the, in, in the country. Offshore is a little more expensive, obviously, but you have areas like the Permian and Eagleford. Um, the Bakken, which are just much, much lower. So technology has been been a driver of that. Um, you have the rig count is is down. It's actually the rig count has actually dropped nine months in a row. Uh, we're at seven hundred and fifty rigs. You know, you look at five years ago, we were double that. So I think consolidation is is natural right now. Um, you have technology that's improving, and you also have these these oil and gas companies that are just flush with cash. I mean, their their end product, um, oil, has has gone up drastically, and it's stayed high. I mean, you're at ninety dollars a barrel. We've been there for quite some time, and if your break even is forty or fifty dollars a barrel, that's a lot of profit margin. And they're they're kicking it back in dividends. They're doing they're doing uh, share buybacks, but they're also just flush with cash right now. So when you're flush with cash, why not go out and and acquire? And I think you're gonna. I think it's gonna be a continued trend um and i think it's gonna i think it's gonna pick up yeah i i agree it is kind of something at the moment but it really feels like nothing in the sense that it's business as usual i feel like this story of bringing everything else back on shore and focusing on the permian and the bakken and other domestic production instead of going you know to the middle east or africa or offshore in order to find oil uh, that's the real story is this 15 year theme of hey fracking unlocked all this resource and we don't have to go to all these dangerous places we don't have to mess around in (laughs) scary countries anymore let's just do it here and i think the big players as you said are flush with cash cash and they can do this kind of thing versus you know oftentimes especially in semiconductors we see the margins are real tight and as they get tighter you see the mergers because they go ah we can cut some back off expenses and we can maintain our margins if we merge with another you know semiconductor this is the big players going we're we're we don't know what else to do with our cash. Let's buy more oil. Let's get more energy. And they're focusing on domestic. And yeah, I don't know if we'll uh, 
like all the bank mergers will end up with just the bank at the end of the street. I wonder if we'll end up with just the standard oil company at the end of the street. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know. I think they're, I think, the, and, you know, these are, these are big players too. It's not Exxon Huge. buying some, buying some small little one. It's Exxon buying, you know, buying Chenier. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's Chevron and Hess. I mean, these are, these are big, big players that are coming together. It's a market share grab, just like anything else. Um, mm -hmm. And they're trying to diversify their, their, their portfolio from, from doing everything from upstream, midstream, downstream to gas, natural gas. And, you know, I say it all the time, you know, at $33 trillion in debt that this country has, it's going to be very difficult um, to get out of it, either, def, you know, inflate, default or grow. And the way we can grow is by using the resources currently in our own backyards and it's oil and gas. Um, so we got a lot, we got a lot, we got a lot there. So, uh, well, let's move on to the next one. Um, the EU tackles deficits of 80% debt to GDP. The U.S. is at 140% debt to GDP. Um, is this something or nothing? Oh, this is definitely something. Uh, and I'd take it a step further. Joe Biden introduced a bill where <laughs> maybe we'll see her in role play later. Janet Yellen was interviewed uh, by the Senate and her just kind of cross-examination about that. It was asked about the deficit if, $2.7 trillion, which will be the largest deficit and more than double than what it was last year for over 8% in a time where GDP is at the moment running above three and a half percent. So I think this is definitely something you can't run fiscal deficits in good times at seven, eight percent without some major consequences. And you've seen that in the debt to GDP ballooned to 140. When you want to compare other kind of OECD countries or the G7 or the G20, and you see especially Europe, which is our best peer comparison at only 80 percent debt to GDP and having fiscal deficits of zero or two percent. They run like states, not this country. This is a big problem. And I don't know where it plays out in the U.S. dollar or if it plays out in treasuries. I mean, we've seen the treasury rates kind of skyrocket recently, but I think this is a big something that the EU is handling their business and the U.S. is just kind of closing its eyes and they're going to say, we're going to just keep spending. There's no limits to our spending. It's it's crazy. I mean, I know we talked about this last time and the number is probably even higher, but I think it was we're at 900 billion year to date, just an in interest carry that that we just tacked onto our debt. I mean, as they raise rates, um, the cost of interest is just going higher and higher and it's just ballooning on 33 trillion and counting. It's just a snowball effect. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, it, we have to tackle this and it's you know, Washington is a mess right now. And I mean, I'm not hopeful, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens, but I, I agree with you. I, it's what keeps me up at night is the debt a hundred percent. We can kick the can down the road just so long for so long until it's going to come back and, and bite us big time. All right. For our last one, um, <laughs> we go back to Europe. There is a car called the Microlino that's being rolled out. It is a tiny car, Tom. You know those smart cars you used to see? It's about half the size of that. It looks, I don't know, like a go-kart you're getting into that has walls. Uh, it has a max speed of 55 miles an hour. It only has a 143-mile range, and it looks just like the one from the Black Mirror episode with Dallas Howard where she gets stuck and it stops working and can't get around anywhere. So to me, I, I wonder, the tiny car coming to Europe, and the tiny car coming to U.S., or are these tiny cars going to be something, or is this a big nothing? First of all, I have never heard of these. I had to Google it right before we jumped on this podcast. When, when I, when They're I ridiculous saw that. looking, right? Just just so our listeners can have a visual, it looks like something that Mr. Bean got out of. It's like one of those <laughs> little tiny cars. I think it's absolutely nothing. Um, I mean, one, it's a it's a death wish. You get hit in that thing, it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna crump up like an accordion. Um, and I, I mean, look, we, we just said it on the on the front end of the call. I mean, look at Ireland to every. To, <laughs> 70% of their carpenters are SUVs right now. I don't think people are going backwards into these ultra, ultra tiny cars. Um, I mean, at that point, at 55 miles an hour, 143 mile range is what you said. You're yeah. better off just getting a getting a scooter. Yeah, or a golf cart. <laughs> golf cart. Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess people might use this as a third car or an additional extra thing to just, oh, I got to go down the street, maybe something small, but. I can't see it replacing somebody's primary vehicle. You, just, you can't go fast. You can't go far. Uh, I, I just, there's no hope for this little guy. I mean, I could see like, I could see a, 
a time where one, you know, a whole city just limited ca- to cars to just this. I'd be more comfortable yeah, with that. that makes sense. You know, yeah. all it takes is one of these liberal cities to say, okay, no more, no more gas, no more cars over a certain size. We're all going to go into these micro linos, and that's how you're going to get around. It's like, you know, an episode of the Jetsons. <laughs> yeah, maybe like the central business district. They say, hey, can't ha- can't drive in there unless it's a tiny car. So, all right, uh, where do you want to go next, Tom? Let's go to uh, let's go to mailbag. It's time to hear from listeners as we open the mailbag and answer your questions. So I've had a few I've had a few questions talking to clients as of late uh, about crypto, which um, hasn't you know hasn't really made headline all that much until recently with the the huge jump that we've seen in the last week with with the SEC approving new ETFs. Um, Coincidentally, you have Sam Bankman Freed on trial as we speak right now for the whole FTX collapse. Uh, crypto or Bitcoin in particular is up year to date 107%. Uh, we actually just went off. Uh, well, also, you know, let me stop there. What, what are your thoughts on, on crypto? Do you think this is just another another blip and it's going to come back down is it i don't think it's a fad i think we're we can all agree it's it's here to stay um you have that the happening the happening what's it called that the, the happening event that's coming up expected uh, uh ne- early next year you know as far as clients go we can't invest in in cryptocurrencies but just in general there is a lot of, a lot of money in the cryptocurrency space you know that that's just facts there's a ton of money there there's a ton of money still going there there's institutions behind it um it's a, it's a risk on asset so when you start seeing an asset like crypto do well in an environment like we're in right now you know what is that saying and i'll throw out a stat you know prior to this past week when the sec announced and crypto went vertical um, we went on the longest streak in the history of Bitcoin where we didn't see a 10% move in a given day. It's been extremely, how do I say this? It has not been as volatile as it typically has been. And in fact, if you look, I saw an interesting stat the other day. You look from like mid-September to mid-October of this year, the 10 to 20 year bond index was more volatile than Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, whoever thought we'd see that where you have bonds, treasuries, government backed bonds, more volatile than what we consider one of the most volatile asset classes ever, which was Bitcoin. Um, I thought that was was pretty interesting and worth worth mentioning. Yeah, I think that the uh, the rise in rates, especially long duration, you could end up with 25, 50 percent losses on some of those bond funds, which is really, really wild. But that's the reality. You take that one percent increase and it happens twice and suddenly you're down a significant amount on bonds. So I think that that phase was something that people got a little bored during COVID, got excited about. I think that AI is where all the VC funding's going. I think robotics is where the VC funding's going. But I mean, this year, especially in the spring, April and May, you saw the excitement and the potential of AI. I've been waiting for crypto to show me something for what is it, five years now? How long has Bitcoin been around? It's been a while. Now, AI, I think that has some potential, but you know, I'll wait for Silicon Valley's next trick. You sound very bitter no, about it. <laughs> I, I just, I've, I've seen people, it's the same thing with the meme stocks. I've had meetings with clients or prospects and they, you know, it's almost like shameful. They come up, ah, you know, I got kind of wrapped up in that. Well, how did it go? And they show it up and they're down 99%, 100%. Why did you do this? Oh, I thought I was going to make a lot of money. That was it. There was no, oh, I think this company is going to become a bigger company that it is today. Or I see some opportunities for them and improving their margins. Or, hey, they got this merger hat. There was nothing. It was just, hey, uh, I saw this thing online. I bought it. No, I like I said, I don't, I don't disagree with you. But I, I do think it's interesting. I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, again, the SEC getting you know, behind it. Um, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, let, let's jump over to our, our next question that we've been getting a lot that we continue to get. I feel like we've been getting for the last three years and it's it's bonds. Um, I, I just saw a stat out there on a 60-40 portfolio. Do you know what the return has been over the last 10 years? 2, 2.5% a traditional 60-40 portfolio has done over the last 10 years. Um, uh, I, and I know. <laughs> and it's, but it's still it's, appropriate. It's still the right one for a lot of people. I'm not going to yeah, let it I, go. I, I agree. I mean, we're going on. This will be, if we finish this year 
where we're at today in bonds, which is down, if you look at the ag, it'll be the third consecutive year of negative performance on the ag, which has never happened before in the history yeah. of bonds. Um, it's been the longest stretch. And again, it has to do with, with interest rates and, and how quickly they, they've gone up. Um, what does this look like going forward? I mean, so, so you're taking the stance that we need it 60, 40, still the way to go. Well, not for everybody, but that's the starting point. We still need no, bonds I mean, for, in the a portfolio. Mod, for a moderate risk investor. I think it's still appropriate. And the hard part has been that, you know, within your 60, 40, there's a couple of components. So on the 60 side, you got large cap growth, which has been pretty good. Large cap value, which has been okay. You have a bunch of small cap, which has been terrible. It hasn't done anything. Now we've had periods of time like this where, for five years, they do nothing. And then the next five years, it flips and goes the other way. And I think that small caps is a good example of that. But also, if you look at bonds, um, you know, I, I heard or rather I read a note from an investment company saying that there's an asymmetrical opportunity in bonds. And what they meant was if you buy the two year, the five year, the 10 year U.S. Treasury and over the next year, you clip your coupons at five percent. That's a pretty good return. Well, if interest rates go down one percent over the next year, you're going to kind of double that. And that's a really great return, especially in bonds. Now, the flip side is what if interest rates still keep going? Let's say they go up another 1% over the next year. Well, you just break even. So they'd have to go up 2% from here to keep going. And that would put us, as far as the U.S. goes for treasuries, you know, in some really bad company. And maybe that debt to GDP thing that we talked about earlier is a problem and it becomes a basket case. But outside of some major spike in interest rates, you make five. I mean, muni's tax equivalent, you're looking at over 7% over the next five years. That's a really attractive entry point. So you've had the pain. Now let's not give up. Let's stick with the payoff. Uh, I think the 60-40 yeah. will still work. Bonds have just had a tough time. We haven't, had bear, like you said, bond bear market for three years like this. Never happened. I mean, if you look at October of last year, what was the big thing? Hey, buy bonds. The interest rate rise is over. And it's been a terrible move. So I think a lot of people were early, got burned, but I would stick with it. No, I, I agree. And, and, and it's not rising rates. People, I think this is a misconception. Rising rates is not bad for bonds. It's the velocity that they yeah. go up. So when you got these big jumps, it's, it's, there's nowhere to hide. And, and the reverse is true too. Look at the taper tantrum going back to 2013, the last quarter of 2013, the, the, the 10 year went from two and a half to 3% within three months. Bonds got hit. Everyone was calling for higher rates. That's it. Then rates dropped in 2014 and the best investment you could have made in 2014 uh, was TLT or the, or the, the long, long dated treasury, which was up 20, 25% in 2014, an annual return for, for bonds. So as quickly as they can go up, they can come down. But I agree with you. I think we, we're already there. We're already at higher rates. The pain has already been felt. Now you can re, you can get rewarded by getting your 5 6% uh, almost risk free on on the yield. Mm -hmm. And as long as we don't go up from you know the 10 year doesn't go from 5% to 10, I think we're going to be in good shape. I mean, you got to remember we were at almost 0 2 years ago. We were at 50 basis points and now we're at almost 5. So again, as long as it doesn't double from here, I, even if it goes up a little bit, I think it's going to be a lot slower this time. I don't see how it can continue to go up uh, that much more um, before it becomes really, really attractive to a lot. I think might now might be the time. So I agree with you. I think bonds are still there. It's It's been tough because it's been a tough going on three years uh, where we've had negative returns. And looking over the long term, it's really put a – it's really hurt the performance. But – I think well that and we have the magazine test right so the Wall Street Journal had an article about the 6040 they even called it this trusted 6040 investing strategy just had its worst year in generations that's typically a time to buy <laughs> it is I want to go when there's trouble uh, and so with the Wall Street Journal all we need is the economist cover saying bonds are dead or bonds are over and man I'll pile all in right I mean, listen, I think if you can barbell your portfolio with just straight up crypto and TLT, you're going to do really, really well. That's just a joke. Don't do that. We don't recommend it. We don't make recommendations on this podcast. Um, but we'll end with this, Kevin. We are a long way away from the S&P 5000 year end. Uh, that was your are bold, we, are bold we? call. We had, that's like a we're, we're only 800 points away. Hold here. on. What are we talking about? Well, Tom, the best thing that I can say about that is there's this little guy. He's not that little. There's a man in a red suit who comes at the end of every year, <laughs> if you're good, 
and he'll either leave you coal or some great gift. So I'm going to hang my hat on the Santa Claus rally and I'm not going to give up. I mean, got two months and five days left to go. Why, why give up now? I think 800 points in two months. Easy. Let's see it. Well, we'll, we'll end it. We'll, we'll leave it there and we'll pick up our, our end, end of the month podcast next week. And we'll talk about uh, the Santa Claus rally end of the year and go over some stats and uh, we'll make our predictions. All right, great. Look out for our uh, Medicare open enrollment video, which uh, will be published relatively soon. All right. Thanks, Kevin. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets. This podcast is intended strictly for educational purposes only and is not a recommendation for or against cryptocurrency.